Hi, and thank you for joining Jim and I for another great episode of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And it's Hooray Beaujolais tonight. And this is also, Jim, our exact six-year anniversary show. Six years ago today in September, I believe, we filmed our first show. What a long, wonderful trip it's a been. A long and wonderful trip, yes. Yeah, so thank you again for uh, joining me on this wonderful wine-filled journey. So, and this we, is something new for us tonight. It is. It, it is. We've never done a Beaujolais show before, and I've really been hitting the books on this one because I've always been fashioned by Beaujolais, and we're going to give you some information that you probably aren't familiar with and uh, taste some really interesting red wine tonight. So I'm very excited. I am too. I've, I've always been a little biased against Beaujolais. Uh, it's made with a Gamay grape, and I, I wasn't really a big fan, uh, but most of what I had been exposed to was the Beaujolais Nouveau. And what we're going to taste tonight is a step above that. So this is, this is going to be some good, good Beaujolais. That Correct. And uh, it's only a half-hour show, but um, we're going to actually start off with the probably one that everybody is familiar with is the George Dubouf Beaujolais. And he's sort of the one um, that sort of started the whole Beaujolais and Beaujolais Nouveau craze back in the late 80s. He has one of the biggest operations. He did most of the marketing and advertising back in the 80s. It did not go well, though, from a certain point on, but we'll get into that later. But that's the first one we're going to be tasting tonight. Yep. And uh, it's probably the one that everybody is familiar with. It's everywhere, if you look in the French Beaujolais section. And Jim, give us a little idea of what it is about the Gamay grape. Why is that? What, is, what makes that unique? Well, the, the Gamay grape actually is a cross between Pinot Noir and uh, Gouy Blanche. And the Gouy Blanche is a grape variety you don't run across very often. Uh, they don't grow it too much anymore, but it has actually fathered or mothered a lot of other grapes that are grown throughout France and Germany. I think Gamay is probably the most well-known. Um, but it's it, just like Pinot Noir, Gamay is a very light wine. Uh, when, you, when you look at this, uh, very light. It's, it's a light in color, it's light in body. It's a red grape, but it actually produces a white juice, and then the, the skins are in, are in contact with that juice, and that's what gives it the red color. But it's, um, I think, most famous for the Beaujolais Nouveau. That's what people here in the United States know the Gamay grape for. Uh, and that's, that's a wine that's released the third Thursday of November. And as soon as that comes out, uh, everybody rushes out and buys that. And then you have to drink it quickly. It's a very young wine. It's meant to be consumed very, very early. Um, and I've actually found out if it's bad luck to drink it after the new year. So you've got like a six-week time frame to get the the Beaujolais Nouveau into your stomach. And just so there's no confusion, Beaujolais, you'll see Beaujolais on every one of these bottles. That's right. the region right. of France yeah. that we're talking about. Beaujolais is in eastern France. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, it's a region in eastern France. Uh, it's just south of Burgundy, just north of Lyon. Um, and there are three different levels of Beaujolais. There's the Beaujolais Nouveau, which is uh, what the wine for the peasants, as it's known. Uh, it's the very low-end stuff. Uh, that gets fermented for just a handful of days and then bottled immediately and shipped out to market. Uh, what we're going to drink tonight is Beaujolais Village, and these are named after specific villages within Beaujolais. And those are a higher quality wine. Uh, they age a little longer. They've got a lot more character to them. And at the very top of that is Beaujolais Cru, and we're going to have a Beaujolais Cru at the end of the evening tonight. Um, the Beaujolais region has 39 different villages, so you'll see 39 different Beaujolais Village on the shelves, if you had a, a full complement of Beaujolais Village. Uh, but there are only 10 crews, and uh, we're going to drink one of those tonight, the Moulin Avant. And they've been growing wine in that region since the Romans, so over 2,000 years ago. And I think we talked about this earlier from the 7th century up until about the Middle Ages. The Benedictine monks were the major wine growers in that region. And I think in the 15th century, uh, the area was so to uh, uh, the Burgundies, actually. Mm -hmm. And they ran it for a while. But, so the stuff from this region has is, is been around for a long time, which is what I like. So we're going to try our first sip tonight. All right. This is the George de Boeuf Beaujolais Village. Very light right off the bat. Very light. Very fruity, though. You get an explosion of fruit in your mouth. I get some raspberries with this. It's funny because I knew you might say that, and I know when you do the research like I did on Beaujolais, because I don't drink a lot of them, I actually don't think it's that bursting with fruit uh, right off the bat. Now, this is only my first one yeah. here, and I've had this one at numerous times. It's probably very inexpensive uh, Beaujolais. You see this in a lot of places. But I will say it's still very easy to drink. Uh, whether it's yeah. the spring, summer, or fall, winter, it's an easy-to-drink red wine. When you compare this to everything else we're going to have tonight, 
you're going to see how, how much fruitier this is. And that's, that's George DeBuff's style. He, he likes to have a lot of fruit in the wine. Uh, but you brought up uh, seasons to drink this. And, you know, when people think of Beaujolais Nouveau, they drink it right when it comes out, uh, the third Thursday of, of November. Um, but the Beaujolais Village actually, I think, is a great summertime wine. It's uh, supposed to be served chilled. You want to serve this at about 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So I think it's the perfect wine to have if you're out on the back porch and you're not feeling in the mood for a white. You know, Bob and I usually like to have a Sauvignon Blanc in the summertime. But uh, this is something you could serve out on the porch uh, because you're going to chill it. I think, and it pairs well with uh, some of the summertime foods that you'll eat. It pairs well with fish. Uh, pairs well with salads. Um, you can do a kind of a broiled chicken with this. Yeah, you know, I'm, a, here. I'm actually a little disappointed in myself because I was so into rosés all summer mm -hmm. and uh, Pinot Noirs. I'm kind of kicking myself now in afterthought. I probably should have had a couple Beaujolais there. We ignored the entire we did. region. We ignored <laughs> the Beaujolais. So we weren't doing hooray Beaujolais over the summer, but we are now. So uh, for inexpensive French wine, um, I'm going to give this a thumbs up right off the bat. Very pleasurable, I easy to drink, nothing disgusting or lingering in the mouth. It's just your mouth feels fresh, and uh, it, it's really nice. Yeah, it's got the right amount of acidity, so it, it cleanses the palate real quickly, and then that disappears. Um, it's just a slight tannic finish on this. And we're actually, we'll get it when we finish our taste, so we're going to try to quickly grow into the controversy about uh, Beaujolais Nouveau and how that all started in the 80s up to where we are now. But we want to get to the tasting first because I'm very uh, interested in what we're going to taste next. All right. Next up is the Jean-Marc Bourgogne. And this one's going to have a lot more tannins to it. I thought this was a great contrast from the George DeBoeuf. It looks lighter in color a little bit. It does. Yeah, you can, you can see right through this. Very clear wine. The nose is definitely a little heavier. I, I get a little earthier. Yeah, your quintessential French terroir-ish type red wine. Right. A lot of people don't like that. I personally do. But I like it right now. I think it's very minerally, like you said. Yeah, it's got a good stone minerally finish. Um, the, you know, the tasting notes said saline. You get a, kind of a little salty finish with this. You know, I get that now. After a few, a few seconds in the back of my throat, I do get a little of the saltiness, mm -hmm. which uh, is pleasurable, especially if you're eating cheese and crackers or something like that. So uh, that, that's actually pretty good. And how did you find this one? Well, actually, the, what turned me on to Beaujolais, I did a tasting uh, about six months ago, and it was all Beaujolais. And I, I had a new appreciation for Beaujolais after doing that tasting. Is that, but my entire experience had been with the Beaujolais Nouveau. I had a friend in Chicago who did a, a Nouveau tasting every November and he'd buy five or six different uh, vineyards production. And we'd taste through all of them. And I never was impressed with any of it. And it's because they're such young wines. And, and you know, as with an American palate, I'm expecting something big and bold and... And that's not what you get with Gamay. No, that's, that's what you're probably going to get, at least from my experience with what I've tasted, though I don't know what's going to be at the end here. And uh, I don't know if you know this, Jim, but uh, the Beaujolais region actually does produce a white, but it's only 1% of the whites that come out of the Beaujolais region are white. 1%. I didn't know that. It is with the Chardonnay grape. It, they're very uh, quirky, but um, according to my research, 1% of wine that does come out of the Beaujolais region is white. Do they export that to the United States? They don't. There's so much to get into in such a short time. A lot of stuff that comes out of that region does not get exported. Charles de Bouffe actually is one of the biggest exporters of wine from that region. He handles probably 70, 75% of it. A lot of the other stuff is either small vineyards that do not export at all, and you have to either go through specialty uh, distributors and stuff like that mm -hmm. to get it, or actually have to go to France to buy it. Because France is very strict with what they export out of their country in regards to the wines. So and they want to keep the good stuff for themselves. And generally that's the case. So it's very <laughs> difficult to get some stuff. Um, I know some of the stuff we're looking at the table tonight, obviously everything on the table tonight is accessible, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, this, I, I got all this here in the United States. Yeah, that's what I assume. But it, it's not yeah. difficult to go into a bigger store, go to the French mm -hmm. section with the... Uh, uh, region is and find these. Yeah, the, uh, the George de Boeuf especially, you'll see that everywhere. And the last one we're going to have, this is uh, from the Chateau Jacquard, uh, which is it's a very big um, vineyard as well. You, you find their stuff everywhere. Well, completely different style This from the first one, but there's a place for it in the Bobby P. Library. So uh, I'm still going to give it a thumbs up because uh, I like French terroir driven wines. I, I thought you would appreciate this because this is more your style. Yeah. Uh, I'm also going to give it a thumbs up. It's, it's easy drinking, just like everything we're going to have tonight. It's very light. Um, you know, there's a time and a place for it, but I, I really enjoy it. 
All right, so mine is the next one, and uh, it's interesting. When I went in to uh, look for some Beaujolais, there, there's not a lot to choose from. It's actually a very small section in the store. And I think this is the... Uh, Domaine Pignard. Domaine Pignard. This particular vintage is 2014. But, and this is very important, actually, by the way, for Beaujolais. This particular vintage, I think, is an 88-pointer. The 2013 is a, almost, a, I think, is an 89 or 90-pointer. So that's how, depending on you know, the crop and so forth like that, they can jump up and how they're rated. So this had a nice tag. It said what the rating was. I looked at the tag and said, okay, I haven't had this one. I'd give it a shot. So I'm going into this cold turkey tonight, go strictly by what I read in the, in the mm -hmm. liquor store, and um, we'll see what happens. I haven't had this one either. But this, this goes back to our last episode when we were talking about the wine ratings and how sometimes stores don't change the ratings. Uh, you have to be careful when you're purchasing wine to make sure you're, getting, uh, you're looking at the rating that's for the year of the wine that they're selling. Because the price difference can be huge. Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually a very good point because when I actually brought the wine home, I didn't have my phone with me to have my application. And you look up a particular vintage, this same vineyard, the price differences in the ratings are quite substantial from yeah. the 2011, 12, 13, 14. That, it, that's because it probably crossed the 90 point threshold. Exactly. Anytime a wine goes over 90 points, the price just skyrockets. So here we go. All right. And you know, this one's darker, right? It is much Absolutely. darker than the last one, yeah. Not quite as fruit forward as the first Charles um, or George de Buffon. Nope. And I'm, yeah, I'm getting a harsher finish with this. I don't want to say flat, but um, it's probably more one or two notes rather than a bouquet of right. notes. And that's, again, that's why I, I wanted us to do the George de Buff first, because it's just an explosion of fruit. And it's, it's uh, quite a contrast to what we're drinking now. I remember, if you like that in a wine, especially if you like red wines and you don't like anything too heavy, then you're not going to go wrong with the George. Mm -hmm. But in the progression that we're going tonight, it's a good example of the range that is available for Beaujolais, because even though it's a Beaujolais, they're not all going to taste the same. And I, actually, I think this one almost demands food. I think you should probably have some kind of creamy cheese with this that would kind of even out some of the harsh notes. Yeah, I can see that, absolutely. Let me, actually, let me try a little cheese here. What's great about Beaujolais, this show tonight, and hopefully we can get into some of it before we wrap up, is the history and just how... Um, it's gone up, it's gone down, and there's so much controversy still to this well, day. I know you, you did a little research here, so go I, ahead and, yeah, it, go ahead well, and share. The whole Beaujolais craze, Beaujolais Nouveau craze, started in the 80s. And Beaujolais Nouveau was just huge. I mean, the demand for Beaujolais Nouveau was so big that most of the uh, vineyards in that region couldn't keep up with the demand. Everybody wanted it. So unfortunately, and, and, and George de Buff was one of the biggest exporters at the time. And he was responsible for the marketing and advertising to get Americans, especially in the world, to drink this young wine. The problem is they started producing crap mm -hmm. wine because they couldn't keep up with demand. So you had a lot of vineyards that just started throwing stuff out. So by the mid to early 90s, there was a backlash. A lot of the wine experts said, this is enough. This stuff is terrible. Yep. You know, we're, we're, it's over. It's done. So those French vineyards, especially some of the big companies, were left with huge amounts of unsold Beaujolais, especially Beaujolais Nouveau. Mm -hmm. So according to French law, it had to be destroyed. You can't, you can't sell it. Yeah. So they took a killing. And it took some time for the winemakers to say, look, we can't, we got to go back to our roots and start producing, like, like Jim was talking about earlier, there's three phases or three styles of Beaujolais mm -hmm. and spending more time in getting the quality rather than the quantity. But that's still, there's still another controversy that happened in the late 2000s with our friend George that um, uh, we'll get into after I think we taste the third one because my palate's yeah. a little... Okay, before we talk about him, yeah, I just wanted to go back to, uh, we did an episode probably six or seven months ago about the Lambrusco from Italy. And they, they went through the exact same thing. They, they started producing it and it got more and more popular here in the United States. So they produced more and more. And, and the next thing you know, the quality just went downhill. And people here in the United States said, oh, this stuff's garbage now, and they quit buying it. That's what happened and, here. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And so they got stuck with a whole bunch of Lambrusco that they couldn't sell. So. And it actually was so bad, a, a, wine, ma a, a, a wine magazine newspaper in France, uh, their wine expert actually did a critique, which is really what started the downfall for the uh, Beaujolais. He, he said exactly what we were just talking about, that they produced too much, the French weren't keeping up to their standards, mm -hmm. and they were releasing crap to the world. Yep. And he, they, the, those vineyards actually sued the magazine. Mm -hmm. For slander, yeah, claiming which is, which is legal in France. It is legal in France, yeah. and they actually first won their case, 
uh, and the courts awarded um, $350,000 to the newspaper because they said the newspaper had a legitimate right. But then the appeals took place, and then the appeals said no, um, they had the right to print that review, and it was reversed, and then the uh, vineyard had to pay the newspaper. For the court costs? For the court okay. costs. So, but we'll get into the other big scandal later on. But well, you, know, you know, the other odd factoid that comes up is uh, France actually turns leftover wine into ethanol for their automobiles. So here in the United States, we turn corn into ethanol and add that to the gasoline. In France, they turn leftover wine into ethanol and add that to their gasoline. That's why everybody's happy in France. Yeah. They're breathing fumes <laughs> laced with alcohol. Now I understand it. Not, that's why they're singing and dancing yeah, on the streets. Traffic jams right. don't upset them. That yeah. explains a lot now. All right, that's great. So what is our third one? Uh, we drank the third one, didn't we? I'm sorry, the fourth one. All yes. right. I'm going to pour this. This is the Domaine Lagno. And I'm actually going to have to finish my last one. By the way, I just looked at my notes here, and uh, over a million cases of Beaujolais Nouveau, mostly, mostly Beaujolais Nouveau, had to be destroyed in 2001 because there was so much of it left over. Waste. Unbelievable. I hope they turn that into ethanol. Uh, when they say destroy, they didn't exactly go into detail. I'm assuming yeah. part of that was part of it, because destroy doesn't mean you just dump it somewhere. It's just they redistill well, it or something actually, like that. Actually, you know, the, the story I told on the, uh, a show a couple months ago was um, about the company in California that shipped over a whole bunch of sparkling wine to France, but they made the mistake of putting champagne on the label, and the French destroyed that. They said, you can't call this champagne because it's not from champagne, yeah. so we're going to destroy it. Destroy it. That's just, yeah. Can't even give that to the homeless, can no. you? No. No, it's like the Prohibition <laughs> days all over again. You just get the guys out there with the axe, hacking away at the That barrels. is amazing stuff. Now, this is probably one of the darkest ones I've seen tonight. That Yeah. I would not have guessed, just looking at this, that that's a Gamay grape. Now we're back to the fruitiness. Mm-hmm. A drier fruitiness, yeah, but it's definitely more complex. George was good. We got a little drier, a uh, little bit more flute, one or two notes. Now we're back to a little bit more. Um, it's uh, yeah. There's more tannins with this too, and it's, it's a more a little, acidic, I, I believe yes. too. All these yep. reds are very acidic. Yeah, I'd be very curious to do that acid show again with some of these uh, mm -hmm. wines to see how it would rate. Check the pH balance. This is really interesting, though. Well, that's that is one of the characteristics of the Gamay grape is that it is acidic. And it's, it's because it's acidic and fruity, and it kind of lends itself to being served chilled. And we haven't actually discussed the price points. I Really quick, I know uh, the George is available in most places between $9.99, $12.99. Um, I think this is yours, That's uh, under 15 Under yeah. 15 The Picnard uh, is between $12.99 and $14.99. Uh, the Domaine Lagno is 15 to 20 Yeah, and you don't really see a lot of, you can see a lot of high price ones. But generally, you don't see anything in the fifty dollars range for no. Well, not until this is these are all Beaujolais Village, and so those are under twenty dollars, which they should but, really yeah. be. When you get to the Beaujolais Cru, and the last one we're going to have is Beaujolais Cru, um, I paid thirty to thirty-five for that one, and I, you, you can you can still stay under fifty dollars and buy a, a Beaujolais Cru, but you're going to pay more than you would for a Beaujolais Village. I remember what you're getting when you decide to drink a, a Beaujolais is you're getting an easier to drink not quite as complex, but fruitier wine. Mm -hmm. So I think for a lot of people, I mean, people who are watching this show, if they've been watching it for six years or just a week, um, you know, they might not know their palate. These wines, I think, are going to agree with most people's palates. Right it's, yeah, there. it's a very friendly wine. That's probably the best way to describe it. There's nothing snobby here no. in, these, in these flavor profiles. So you, you shouldn't be intimidated by when you go into any store, hopefully go to a bigger store where they have more of a selection, and go to the Beaujolais section, because at least from my experience, at least right tonight, um, you're not going to be disappointed. So, really good. I'm not disappointed now. No, this is fantastic. Before we move on to the last wine, I did want to discuss the winemaking process for Beaujolais because it's a little different from traditional wines. You know, with a traditional wine, they harvest the grapes and they throw the grapes into a vat. And sometimes they leave the grapes on the stem, sometimes they remove all the grapes. Uh, and then they just crush the grapes and get all the juice out. With Beaujolais, it's a little bit different process. Uh, this is all hand harvested. They throw the grapes into a vat with the stems on, or with the grapes still on the stems. And instead of putting pressure on top to crush it, uh, they just let the, the weight of the grapes crush what's on the bottom. So the stuff on, st on top stays whole, 
and the, the grapes on the bottom get crushed into juice. And they've got a lid on the vat, uh, and the oxygen in the vat gets consumed during the winemaking process. So as the, the grapes are fermenting, they're creating alcohol, they're creating CO2, all the oxygen is getting sucked out of the vat during that process. And then uh, the whole process goes into a second fermentation. Um, the, because there's no more oxygen, the, the primary fermentation can't occur anymore, uh, but there's a, uh, what's called intracellular fermentation, which takes place in the, the individual grapes. And nothing's supposed to, be, is supposed to be added at this process, right? This is all natural? There's, there's, uh, there, some winemakers will add a little bit of yeast. Uh, other winemakers just use the natural yeast in the grapes. So it, it depends on the winemaker. Uh, but yes, that's there's yeah there's nothing else they're throwing in. Well, that that'll go into our story about the George Dubuff. Okay. Um, because that's where the scandal starts. Okay. Um, in two thousand and five. So I don't know if I'm going to talk about that first. Or do let me. Let, I'll just wrap this up real quick. The, um, the you know when the when the grapes start to have that intracellular fermentation, they start to explode. So all these exploding grapes in the vat are are creating this really fruity flavor that which you're getting especially with the George Dubuff. Yes. So it's a they call that carbonic maceration, and I I think it's a, a fantastic way to make wine. It's just it creates this really fruity characteristic that you don't get with a lot of other wines. You don't, and um, <clears throat> especially with George, since he's the biggest exporter, and uh, as the Beaujolais have slowly gotten back to some form of popularity, and it's taken a long time because of just like we had with rosés, um, people sort of associate them with sweet crap wine. Mm -hmm. um, Beaujolais have slowly sort of recaptured a little bit of their provenance. But in 2005, Mr. George um, was sued because they claimed that he was um, mixing two different varietals. Um, he was really? taking a, a less varietal and mixing it with a better varietal. Uh, so it was still it was still Gamay. It was just a little different lower quality Gamay. Different from one vintages region. because okay. one vintage was bad. So he was mixing. Oh, he was mixing years. He was okay. mixing years. Yes, which you're not supposed to do in yeah. France yeah. at all. And uh, they did settle. Um, it was I guess a huge court case, and uh, he uh, he admitted that was a technical error on quote unquote the staffing. Now when we say staffing, this is a big gigantic corporation. And George DeBuff, you might be familiar with this bottle, but there's other stuff that they manufacture, well, manufacturers were warned, but they bottle. Mm -hmm. So you have to always look to see if his name's on there. Because mm -hmm. yeah, he was also involved in another scandal, scandal a few years later, 2006 or seven, where they accused them of adding sugar mm -hmm. to the process. And, and yeah, that's, the French are very, very persnickety about adding sugar. So if you do yeah. some research on your own, there is a lot of scandalous activity yeah. going on over the last six or seven years with Beaujolais is they try to recapture the market they once had. Mm -hmm. And uh, with what we taste tonight, they think they're well on the way of doing that. And I think that that story really highlights the difference between the French approach to winemaking and the American approach to winemaking. Um, a lot of American winemakers are pursuing a specific type of taste. And so they, they grow the grapes and every year, you know, Mother Nature is going to give them something a little bit different and they have to tweak it. They go into the lab and they, they put a little of this in, a little of that in, you know, they do some blending with you know, maybe some juice from last year or from s some juice from the vineyard that's three miles down the road. Uh, and they try to create the flavor that's the same flavor that they produced last year. Whereas the French approach is, here's what Mother Nature gave us this year. That's great. And you're going to drink this. And it's uh, and either it sells well or it doesn't yeah. sell well, and uh, that's just that's just the way it goes. Yeah. So I gotta be honest with you though, I want my thirty dollar bottle of wine All right. on the table. Tonight, so. <laughs> so this is a Beaujolais Cru. Wow, that's light. Very light. And as I mentioned, there there are only ten areas in the Beaujolais region which have been designated as Cru, and this is one. This is the Moulin Avant. So you're always going to pay more from this region. Yes, it's it's part of their AOC hierarchy. Uh, as you go up the hierarchy, uh, it becomes more and more exclusive. It's supposed to mean more and more quality in the wine, but that also means they're going to demand more money for it. Oh, I got to sit down. <laughs> oh my. Now, I hate to get snobby on this show because our show has been going on for so long. We try to keep things in a reasonable manner, under twenty bucks. But this taste. Like an expensive wine. It does. I, I really enjoy this too. You, you get the fruit. It doesn't explode like George DeBuff. And it's not as tight as the, the second wine that we had. Um, but it's, it's a presence that just stays with you throughout the entire experience. Start, middle, finish. 
I'm still experiencing the rhapsody. Give me a moment here. The, that, the, uh, <laughs> wow, that is, I did not expect what I just yeah. tasted in that glass. For such a light color wine to offer that kind of flavor was mm -hmm. really surprising. And there are some tannins to it. They're very subtle, but you, you get a little bit of tannin. But these wines never see any oak. Uh, that's, that's another part of the, the Beaujolais process. That is, is very there's important, no right. oak. And that they don't get into an oak barrel ever. Now, what is the, uh, the actual aging process for these? Can these be stored? Yes, actually, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you know, the, the Beaujolais Nouveau, you cannot store it. You have to drink it uh, between the day you buy it, and it's, you know, the third Thursday in November, up to the end of the year, December 31st. You're, it's actually bad luck, bad luck to drink it after. Besides December bad luck, 31st. will it taste different? It just starts to age in the it's, bottle? Yeah, it's, it's, such a, it's, it's meant to be drunk young, and it's, I don't think it's going to age at all. Uh, the Beaujolais Village, you can age two to five years, depending on who produced it. With the Beaujolais Crew, you can age that up to 20 years. And again, that depends on who manufactured it. Uh, some of them are 10 or 15 years, but, uh, but this particular bottle, you can age up to 20 years. Well, i got to be honest with you. That's, I mean, we tasted a lot of wines in the last couple months between the summer and now. That's up there with one of my favorites. So that's mm -hmm. two thumbs up big time. Yeah. So i got to say, Jim, you know, in our remaining couple minutes here, um, I think we've done a good job of educating our viewers a little bit about Beaujolais, but also not scaring them about Beaujolais. Right, exactly. And that's, yeah, I was kind of nervous about Beaujolais when I first heard about it too. Uh, and that just all went back to my first experience with the Beaujolais Nouveau. Uh, so if, if you're watching the show and you, we have piqued your interest tonight, go out and try some Beaujolais Village. Uh, there's a lot of it in the stores. Uh, they've got, you know, probably seven, eight different uh, villages you can pick from. Uh, and if you're feeling ambitious, Bump up to a Beaujolais crew. Yes, except for our staff and our camera people who are working tonight. It really is bad. You're not going to want to drink any of this after the show. So just forget we said We're taking all the leftovers yeah. home. Yeah, it's, just, it's bad. It is, it's bad. But uh, uh, yeah. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to remind everyone, uh, you can watch previous episodes of our show on whctv.org or on youtube.com. Uh, we've had a couple of issues with the website here at whctv, but they're getting that repaired. And uh, those will be available online. Also, if you have a question or comment for the show, please uh, friend us on Facebook. We're at Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. We spell a lot of L O T T A, and we would love to answer any question you have here on the show. Yeah, so please do that. We're always interested in our feedback, feedback from people. And Jim, happy six years. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming down from Boston. Until next time, keep us in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.